Vinyl? Yeah. Yeah, go. Yeah, go. Tell us more about this. Uh, well, have a good talk. So, yeah, okay. So hi, my name is Chris, and this is my colleague, Diago. Um, we're from a company in, based in Berlin called Indoco. We do open source um, consulting, and among other things, we are working right now with a client who has us basically running um, three Androids on one Galaxy S3 with one gig of RAM. Um, I think there's been a couple talks at this uh, Fossum about running multiple Androids that's mostly based on Zen. I think Samsung's doing work. Um, I, I was watching one of the videos of, not from this Fossum, but from another event, and they were talking about how they were having memory constraints on the Nexus 10 that they're working on with two gigs of RAM. So, you know, that's always kind of amusing for us going with, um, with the constraints that we have. Um, yeah, so um, this talk is actually as much for us as it is for anybody else. Because if you have ideas or anything, please stop us and uh, give feedback, or uh, questions will be very much welcome. And uh, hopefully, after the talk, we can uh, talk to you also about some maybe improvements that you have, some ideas that you have for improvements. Okay, so the first question is what exactly is low RAM? And Google defines this uh, in the recent, I think since about. Um, um, uh, I think sandwich about 512 mix. Um, if you get, if you're at this level or you're below this, then you're probably going to have to look at some of the things we're going to we're going to be showing um, to improve performance or just to modify it to your system um, so that it runs so you get good performance <coughs> from your device. Um, yeah. So when would you really find yourself in this situation? Um, there are actually several reasons why you know. Uh, you have no choice. Maybe you have a client. This is similar to what we're, the situation we're in, um, and basically they you have no um, control over the hardware you have, the memory or anything like that. And so you just have you're just told to do it, and so you're kind of in a bind, and you, um, you see what you do what you can. Um, you could be one of these people who runs devices that are more than about two years old, and then you could be one of these rare people who actually likes to. Um, put an updated uh, Android on these devices. I don't really know any of these people, but they do seem to exist. Um, and then I think some of the more interesting things, you have Android coming into the embedded space where a typical um, or a traditional embedded Linux was found. And so I think we'll be seeing more and more of that. Because um, there are some features there that are quite attractive and makes getting it up um, pretty quick. And then you have what I just talked about, the virtualized Android. Um, actually, I should mention a little bit. We, we work for a company called Trust Core, um, and they're working on this um, security, um, high security Android. And so we have basically two user-facing um, Androids, and then we have a, a third Android that's um, pretty much uh, everything taken out of it, runs on very, um, uh, very little resources. Um, but it, it talks directly to the hardware. So we have basically a layer where the user-facing Androids, uh, um, they have no direct contact to the hardware. And we run this on a microkernel hypervisor. It's not um, Zen. And actually, I think the, the main developer for that is actually, uh, I think they have a talk on the microkernel track. Um, OK, so let's move on and actually look at the layers um, where we actually do things. Um, now, the first layer is the one that's most um, it's the one that's most accessible to everybody. Um, but you can't really ignore this because even if you're um, creating the device, um, you have to make decisions on what apps. You know, For a browser, for example, you have the unmaintained browser that's there now, or you can choose something like Firefox, another open source browser. Um, and if you look at these, you will see that um, they do things, uh, one does things better than the other as far as memory management. And we'll actually talk about why that is. Okay, the next one is the Dolphin VM. As everybody pretty much probably knows, um, uh, Android uses their own VM for Dolphin. And this was for several reasons, licensing, performance, so, uh, et cetera. Um, and we should also point out that they have a new one called Art. And so this actually might have eventually deprecated and uh, not used. But for now, it's still the default. Um, and Activity Manager. Now, this is the integral part of Android, um, and it actually plays a major role in memory management. 
and we'll look at um, just the memory magic portion of this a little bit. And then we have the Linux kernel. This is usually the bottom layer. If you're like us and you uh, actually run over something, you have to have one underneath it to worry about. Um, but yeah, we'll look at a couple ways that um, the Linux kernel, there's some additions from Android, but there's also um, some upstream. Uh, there's a lot of you know Android benefits from, from what's in the Linux kernel as it is. Okay, I'm going to start with the apps, um, and then I'll we'll go over to the Yago for the dollar. Um, okay, so the apps, um, it's important for everybody actually, all the apps, you know, to manage their memory properly. This doesn't happen all the time, or I should say this rarely happens, um, but if, you, if, you're, if your app manages the memory well, then the whole system will potentially be more stable. And so it's a good idea to do that. And we're not going to look at all these um, uh, ways apps can individually manage their um, memory, um, but we're going to look at how the system tells the app um, what kind of pressure it's, it's, um, it's, the system is under so that it can respond to that. And we're just going to look at this very briefly. Um, so yeah, Google says uh, you should implement on trim memory uh, to incrementally release memory based on the current system constraints. Now, ultra memory, um, it takes a parameter, integer, and this is actually a trim level. Um, and this will tell you basically how much pressure the system is under. Um, you have two basic categories. You have your running apps, and then you have your cached apps. The cached apps are basically the ones in the background, um, and they're um, lower down on the LRE list uh, to be to be killed. Um, it's BB. And so this is roughly, we have it, um, you know, this is roughly um, the rows are basically for the urgency. And so, you know, the modern and the, the background for the cache, um, you know, you can, you, you could probably uh, start doing something here, and you probably should. But really, if you get down to critical and complete, then you really, really need to do something. Um, so, but yeah, that, that, that basically, memory can complete means you're all the, you're in the background, and if you don't do something very quickly, you will be completely off the list. Um, oh yeah, there was that seventh one, and this is on a trim memory UI hinge, and this is basically when your when your app loses, um, goes into the background, and it, there's no visible UI, you can do things like freeing your views and freeing your bitmaps and things like that. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Yago now for Yago. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, there was one. And this is um, this is trim on trim memory is um, that started in in um, ice cream sandwich, and so you still need to um, implement the on-load memory for older devices, and that's basically equivalent to the trim memory completely. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over now. Okay. So that again, as Chris said before, is the uh, Java virtual machine that Android uses. So uh, we're going to first look a bit at how uh, Android already does some things to, to keep the memory footprint up. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, DALVM is a register-based uh, uh, virtual machine, uh, whereas the regular Java machine is a stack-based. So yeah, each one has its fans, there's a bit of discussion, but uh, in the register-based uh, virtual machine, um, the, each instruction is more dense in the sense that you have to to put uh, two registers to work with, whereas in the stack you just push or work off one register. But yeah, it also uh, uh, makes the code a bit uh, uh, larger. But yeah, they say it's more performant, so that's what they use. And uh, an important feature of this is that it doesn't use the, the Java class files and jars. It uses a format called dex, and uh, this is uh, a format made for, uh, it's a very compact format. So uh, the Java classes uh, have a lot of duplication. For instance, if you have a, an interface, uh, uh, an implementator of the interface, and a user from the interface, uh, it records the name three times in the, in the Java class file. So yeah, Dex addresses that and makes some more observations <coughs> about that. Um, the, the gain of uh, space is quite high. So a Dex file is uh, 
roughly the same size as a jar file compressed, but the text is uncompressed. And that is uh, important because uh, text files can be mapped directly to the memory, so the kernel can keep the, the, the pages from the file if needs to be. Um, yeah. Also, you might have seen, uh, well, when you're updating Android, you see the style uh, optimizing apps. And this is uh, desktop. This program converts text file to uh, optimized text file or OBIX. And yet, it verifies that the file doesn't do anything illegal. And it also does some optimizations like through empty methods and, and stuff like that, static <coughs> Um, another way that uh, Android saves memory is with the cycle process, which is which handles the spawn of, of new processes. So at boot, cycle loads the common libraries that uh, uh, most apps use, and then it forks the processes. So every process spawned by cycle can share everything, and that's a, a big memory gain. And yeah, lastly, in Android 2.2, uh, they introduced the just-in-time compiler. And yeah, they were saying that uh, at first it, you can reach a two-fold uh, improvement, but uh, in the new KitKat guidelines for low memory devices, they say they say that uh, that for low memory devices you should disable it because it takes memory uh, this JIT catch. Yeah, I think I skipped all the points, but you get the idea. <laughs> so. Uh, you're probably familiar with this with this output, and uh, it's the the Dalvik VM uh, in the logcat, and it's uh, telling us what 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 is garbage collecting. <clears throat> so there's uh, four kinds of garbage collections. Um, here you can only see three, because the last one is called DC for, uh, before OM, and if you get to that point, is that you, you are going to run out of memory, so you don't want that. <coughs> So uh, the rest are uh, GC explicit. Uh, this is uh, when you call explicitly the garbage collector. You can do that in your app, or uh, the framework uh, can do that. Uh, for example, when a binder connection gets dropped, uh, it runs a garbage collection. Um, yeah. Then there's GC concurrent, which is the, the uh, garbage collection. And uh, this runs when the amount of free memory uh, goes below uh, a certain threshold. We'll see a bit more in the next slide about this. And then there's a GC for all, which, uh, is, uh, which happens when you're trying to allocate an object and the heap doesn't have enough space. So it has to do a, a garbage collection and then and grow the heap to, yeah, to make space to, for that object. And how can you tune the heap so that you can uh, yeah, put it the right way for long memory devices? Well, there's uh, six uh, properties you can set in cross property overrides at build time. Um, these are heap start size, and this is the, the size that the heap has on the app just starting. And then there's these two that are, uh, yeah, sometimes are a bit confusing. <coughs> heap growth limit is the limit that the heap has for regular apps, whereas heap size is the limit that the heap has when you declare a large heap property in your Android manifest in your app. And yeah, that's not very good because if the heap is larger, your apps will not perform uh, slower, but some apps might need this, this, this uh, uh, increased heap size. And the next one is heap target utilization, which is what the garbage collection uh, routine uses for knowing when to do garbage collection. And yeah, it's uh, clip to 0 0.8, so if you put more, it will be 0 0.8 anyways. Um, yeah, and the, the, the last two ones, hit main free and hit max free, is the minimum amount of memory that uh, has to be free. So if you go below that, um, it will grow the heat automatically, and max free is the opposite. Um, yeah, now I'm going to talk about a bit uh, JIT and why uh, Google asked for disabling. Um, uh, yeah, you can read there. For the <coughs> low memory devices, we recommend JIT to be disabled entirely. Why is that? Because uh, for 
and when the JIT translates the byte code to negative code, it needs to uh, store it somewhere. So uh, Android has a cache for the negative code in, in, the, in memory. And they, they say that the, you disabled it, you can <coughs> save up 1.5 megabytes per process. Um, <coughs> anyway, you need, to, you need to know, you need to test if it's really worth it, the performance, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, perf the loose performance for the memory. And it's funny because in our case, in our virtualized device, we found that we have increased memory, but also increased performance. But that might be explained uh, because uh, our system has a very slow I.O. and yeah, we need to investigate more of that. So yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Chris again and he will talk about tip manager. <coughs> okay, hello? Okay. Um, so actually I want to go back to the last point I was making about the trim, uh, trimming. Um, we had found and just to give you an example of apps that basically do it well and apps that don't maybe do it so well. So um, people probably know that there's a default browser in Android. Um, and now I think it's unmaintained. Basically Google's doing Chrome now um, for Android. But we found, when we were looking for, we found that the browser was one of our biggest problems as far as memory users. And it wasn't really reacting to the um, memory pressure uh, well, and we found that, for example, Firefox um, on Android was actually um, doing at least something, and it was and it was um, basically it improved our stability quite a bit. So um, we're eventually going to be moving to that, which is quite nice. Um, okay, sorry, on the first slide. Yeah. Okay, so Activity Manager has is is pretty much a central part of Android. It does a lot of things. Um, we're going to basically be looking at the very briefly at the way it, um, it orders your applications um, by priority, and then it, does, it uses this information that, that it's maintaining um, to basically tell the, the um, low memory killer um, you know, which apps have which priority, et cetera. Um, okay, so yeah, so Activity Manager, it, it's always um, maintaining a, a list of the applications and the importance to the user or to the system. There are, there are, you know, the most important are the system, um, system uh, apps, and then there are the foreground apps, um, which have, of course, high priority. And then you have things like um, what are called acceptable apps that are running, processes that are running. And these are things like, um, if you have a music player, it might not be in the foreground, but it's important that it doesn't crash because a user probably doesn't want their listening enjoyment to be interrupted. Um, and if you see here, um, no, I should have probably put it, but um, this is actually, all, the, all these declarations are in the um, process list Java in the, um, in the, uh, in the activity manager code. Um, and so what you see here, it's, it's similar to nice values, but the, the largest number is um, the least important, and then the smallest number is the most important. Now these correspond to values that the um, Linux OOM takes for their um, um, OOM adjust uh, value. Um, and we can see here at the top, you see, you see hidden, I mean, KitKat, I actually changed the cache. Um, because I guess, yeah, it seems to describe it a little better. Um, and you see at the bottom, it goes down to negative 16. These are system <coughs> or system category. Um, there is actually another value that's, um, if you do negative, negative 17, um, that will basically say remove it from, um, remove it from consideration of killing because, um, yeah, and so it's, it's taking it away from this management system, basically. And you may need to do that for, um, for apps that, or processes that really need to stay alive. Um, okay, so it uses this information, like I said, to pass it to the low memory killer. Um, this is a, one of the one of the this is kind of a prelude to the to the kernel change we were, we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, uh, but it's important to talk about it now because this is um, the activity manager and the low memory killer kind of uh, work together because it um, the, low, the activity manager basically feeds the information to the low memory killer with its um, sysfs interface. And yeah, so it, it has, it basically tries to preempt the OM. Um, Android never wants to get to the case where it's really out of memory. Um, and so this kind of, this low memory killer just, instead of out of memory, it's low memory so that um, 
you can avoid actually reaching the level where you actually have to kill the system um, at some things. Okay, so um, this is actually the interface we have. Um, and if you if you do yeah, a cat on these files, you will see um, these values. Now these correspond directly with the, the values that we saw that were defined before um, the first level layer. Although I think if you if you print this out on a KitKat device, you will actually see different values because um, KitKat is now trying to use the more modern instead of OM adjust, which is in the OM, um, which is the OM uses. It used to use, uh, it now uses OM score adjust, I believe, which is um, what um, is current. The OM adjust is deprecated. There's more granularity in the um, OM score adjust. You'll see, uh, I think, a maximum of a thousand. Um, so, so, yeah, and actually the low memory killer has changes now that um, uh, that actually, if you feed it numbers like this, it will actually look for those and then adjust uh, it to the, the newer mechanism. Um, okay, as so you can see the min free. Um, min free values, uh, these are basically, if, these are these are pages, and so um, if it gets down below 10,000 so pages, it'll start looking for the um, the lowest priority apps to start getting rid of those that need to, um, and then so on and so on. So these, these correspond to um, category, and then um, at the point at which they will be um, considered to be killed. <coughs> And this is also in the process list job file. Um, and you can see here you're basically defining um, which categories um, um, that these are for. So all, all this kind of works together. You can see these are this is exactly um, the top. The top line is actually exactly what you feed into the the adjust values. Um, now these this last two this min and min uh, free low and and um, the free high. Now, Android in this in this, um, in this file, you have a an algorithm that basically um, tries to find a nice a nice value for your device. Um, our device is special, of course, because we have a high um, we have a, a very high resolution device and we have very low RAM. So we did make some modifications to this, and so that we you know, have something that ran better for our our device. Um, and, and so you want to know how this works. Um, you can basically look at the dumpsys output, the dumpsys mim info. It'll basically tell you how your apps are prior um, categorized at a certain time. Um, and you can see it starts with the most um, important thing goes down. And so that will tell you the, how much RAM it's using. And then you can also look at dumpsys activity over them. Um, well, I should actually point out that for dumpsys and MIMINFO, you can actually give the process name and actually give you detailed information about the actual process that's running. And on KitKat, they've added actually a couple more categories, which makes it a lot more uh, informative. It'll actually tell you the, um, how much the graphics um, layer is using, how much um, native um, native memory you're using, and things like that. And that gives you a lot more useful information. Um, Dumpsys activity OM, this is basically has three sections of, it, of that um, output. You have the OM list, this is the current um, list that you that we saw that we set before. And then it will give you a bunch of information about the process of the OM control. Um, you can see for you can see the the second line in the output, or the oh, third line I guess, OM max, and that'll tell you like the maximum as it can be. Um, but then you can look over here, you can see which what the current um, is that goes off the screen a little bit. Um, it's, uh, yeah. And so you can get a lot of information on using this. And I'm actually going to be writing a blog post about details of uh, what each of these actually parameters mean. So if you go to our blog in the next couple weeks, it'll be there. Um, and then you can see basically the garbage collector. Um, uh, you can kind of see what's new for, for, um, for the garbage collector. And so it's interesting output to look at when you're trying to debug. Uh, wire system running unstably. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Yaga now. Okay, so uh, lastly, we want to talk about the kernel. Uh, yeah, as we just said before, uh, Android has some modifications to the upstream kernel, uh, but it also benefits from uh, the from the, the the features that are there. Yeah, features uh, uh, that were added by Android uh, are like wake logs, uh, 
trash man and, and yeah, things like that. So the first thing is uh, PSM. It's kind of the same page merging. So this was a feature uh, It was thought for virtualized environments in the sense that uh, when you have uh, several virtual machines in one machine, you're probably going to have a lot of uh, pages in memory repeated. So uh, what this does is merge the pages that are repeated. Uh, and yeah, you can only have one page uh, really in memory. And this page is going to be uh, read-only, and it's going to follow a strategy of copy and write. So when you write onto this page, you will get copied. So yeah, you, you will lose this, <laughs> this benefit. Um, yeah, before we talk about Zygote and how it allows to share uh, pages uh, to, to the spawn apps. So this is uh, more like the same, but the processes don't have to be related in a parent-child uh, relationship. So it does with unrelated processes. Um, yeah, so uh, this was uh, added in the official kit guide for the uh, maintenance of the device use. And uh, you have to be a bit careful with this because uh, when comparing pages, it consumes CPU. So yeah, probably you need to find the right balance for this before enabling it. So how do you enable KSL? It's, it's very easy. Just go to your CSFS and yeah, uh, put a one there in the run and yeah, put some values in sleep millisex, which tells you, uh, well, which tells the KSM uh, how much time should you sleep uh, be, uh, between scans. And you can also uh, define the pages to scan, and so in each scan, we'll scan 128, for example. And you, you have to find the right value for this. Uh, you have to test if how it affects your battery and how it improves your performance. Uh, <coughs> That performance ground usage. And you also have to mark the pages as mergeable. And you can do this with the M advice function and passing this M A D B mergeable. So um, ASP Kitcat only does this in the M map function, as you can see here, and only does it with private and anonymous pages. So that's interesting because in Xanagen mode they've been using this uh, for a uh, longer time and uh, they do it when the Zygote forks uh, the processes and they do it with the heat and stuff values. So that's, that's, that's interesting. And how you find if it's working? Well, just ask our friend Damsis as usual. So with Damsis we mean for you can see uh, the amount of memory saved and the amount of memory shared. And yeah, we reach values of like 20 megs, 20, 25 megs in our device if it runs uh, yeah, enough time. So the other feature, uh, oh, I should mention that the KSM is in the upstream kernel. And whereas this extra free kilobytes is not in the upstream kernel. So I'm going to try to explain this graph. Um, this is uh, the uh, how, how the system looks when you're running out of a uh, low memory. Low memory. Um, you have these watermarks, uh, high pages, low pages, mid pages. So when the memory uh, goes below the low pages, the kernel is trying to is going to try to uh, free pages with the uh, daemon call case of the. So uh, you are getting in a dangerous zone because if you get uh, below the mean pages, uh, you cannot allocate more memory. Only the kernel can do this for its own purposes. So you have to stop the the, the app, and that, that's requesting the, the free page, and then free a page uh, wherever you want. I mean, wherever you can. So this often uh, causes uh, I/O because it's it's very slow. You want to avoid that. And they added this extra free kilobytes feature for exactly this purpose. And so this extra free kilobytes uh, feature, uh, you put there a value, and it makes the delta between mean pages and low pages uh, bigger. So you can allocate uh, memory without running into this I/O. Um, and, yeah, and 
case of the also has more time to, to free pages. So uh, in KitKat it's set to three times uh, a screen with uh, yeah, full resolution and full color. So uh, they do that in, in order to avoid uh, yeah, entering this mode. It's called directory frame. Well, I hope you understand that because I got a bit messed up, but if you have questions about it, just ask. And yeah, now I'm going to freeze to drop it. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay, I should, I should point out that, um, we're, so this is the, pretty much the end of our, our um, talk, but I should point out that we're actually not running on the FD, we're running on the and mine, and we're actually on um, yeah, 2 to 10 3. And so we often find um, the stuff in KitKat is actually, the, the importance for us for KitKat is that Google did a lot of work to improve this. Uh, one of the most important things they did is actually added a bunch of documentation. Uh, I wish they had done that earlier, because most of the stuff we found out the hard way. Um, and, but now, actually, it's pretty, um, it's, it's well documented, actually. There's, um, there's a page on the AOSP, page, um, AOSP um, site for Little Ram. Um, there's some guidelines also on the thinking Android site as well. Um, so it's actually uh, improved the situation a lot. So like I said before, if you're interested, if anybody has any other inputs, uh, you can ask questions or make comments, uh, or we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, so I think that was it, though. All right, thanks.
mobile application, it uses J9 to communicate with Java. With their two commands, it uses more or less memory than more. Okay, I think. Um, yeah, probably something we should probably talk about afterwards because I'm not. I and, uh, yeah, I know there's some, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah, maybe. Um, I didn't actually hear. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make it like... Running native uh, apps instead of uh, the job in memory. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You can. You can. Do you can. 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 And the way they communicate with the entire Android runtime is using JDI. Yeah. So yeah.
Be the gaffer table. <laughs> we'll always do.
we're going to continue. Um, we're going to now look a bit more at routing. Uh, in our Firefox. Um, I don't know if it was last year also, or two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. Uh, three years ago. And now we're going to get an update about all the new features. And I'll let you go to explain all about that. All right. Yeah, thanks for being here to my talk, which is about a uh, short update about what we did in the Bearbox project uh, during the last year. Um, and one of the facts, uh, you might wonder uh, that in fact, you want to put Linux, but a good lawyer, right? In the end, that's usually what, what people want to do, and if that's the case, uh, we are finished here. You can just ask questions and we end this talk here. Um, but in reality, there are some other things you need to take care of. And some other constraints in usual embedded projects. Um, I must say that we are more or less working on uh, embedded industrial uh, no, devices, products, not so much on phones and, and other things you might want to associate with embedded Linux. Our devices are most times things like machine controllers, uh, even uh, machine interface devices and things like that. And in, in that uh, area, there are a lot of interesting use cases where the good owner plays quite an important role. Um, and I will talk about those, those use cases a little later. Um, for those of you who haven't worked with DevOps before and don't know who to get, uh, I have a short introduction about what we are doing there, how it feels like, um, what, what the basic, uh, well, look and feel of the command line is and there. Uh, one of the main things we added during the last year is the free desktop of the Google specification and uh, support for Google devices. And uh, finally, uh, some light features like marketing support capabilities and in the end, some uh, questions and answers. I'm sure it's probably the last part of the use cases here. Um, so what we basically do with the boot loader is that the first thing we're doing is that we do the load out of hardware in this invitation. The CPU comes out of the reset and you need to initialize some things like the memory, the flash, the pillars, the shocks and all these things. And after doing that, the, the second thing is that you need to fetch the kernel from them from somewhere. And this is a way you can find out about boot medium, which can be any of, of, of these here, depending on your use case and on your actual hardware. And when you fetch the kernel from, from the boot medium, you just uh, call it to the kernel and start it. And uh, from there, an embedded Linux system is more or less like uh, any other Linux system where the kernel starts and all the root file system and this kind of things. On an embedded device, uh, you quite often have the use case that you need to design a nice patch screen, like here, uh, somewhere in the hardware visualization when you're up and running and have the graphics uh, running. Then you need to show the flat screen here, and when you fetch a kernel in the background, and you don't want to have a flickering or a blinking or anything like that. And everything's, when everything is uh, finished here, then you just pull into the application, and the application starts and takes over. So that you just switch on at the flat screen, and then it moves on to the application. I have a short demo here. Short uh, video, no fear, no that works. Yeah. And here you can see when it's at zero, we switch on. On the left side, you see the serial console of the device, and here you see the splash screen, and then five seconds after power on, uh, the, the main application, this QT application takes over. And you see that uh, the login, I'll show it again, the login comes even some seconds after the application is already working. So at zero, it is starting, switching on, and so the boot loader, start screen, new starting, so to be application running, and then over there you can see the uh, last of seconds, the login comes to the console. So this is basically how such a device uh, works. What you see here is a 500 megahertz uh, ARM 11. And it's uh, 35 uh, from Freescale in a real uh, customer device in that case here. And this is basically one of our scenarios we have here. Another uh, use case we have is that uh, when the hardware initialization is done here, we in, in some
some cases we have a decision point here in the bootloader where we need to decide if we boot one of two different load loads. Like for example, if you're normally running from here and you're doing a complete image update of your system in field, uh, even without network connection or even without permanent network connection, you download an image or a data image, uh, you, you put it into the second filter slot, and then you just put the other one, for example. Uh, or another scenario, uh, another use case is um, that this might even be more than one filter uh, slot, filter slot A, filter slot B for updates. And if something fails, if something goes wrong with the main uh, control application or something like that, then you might just decide to go into some factory default or into some emergency Linux which just shows in uh, the flat screen which says, uh, well, contact with the service uh, technician or something like that. So deciding between different uh, loads is an important thing. And in most cases, this really needs to be done uh, with the root loader because all the rest of the system can be exchanged uh, during uh, the third update. So the next thing is uh, so a short introduction uh, to the demos. When we need four demos from u back in 2007, there have been a lot of things with u we have not been really happy with. And uh, basically it was that the Gearboot is, is very much uh, written in a microcontroller-like fashion. You have a lot of configure, a uh, lot of um, defines where you can do things on compile time, and you have a lot of things which are really different from what we have learned in the Linux kernel during the last 10 years or so. But the Linux kernel brought up a lot of new good ideas about how to write C code, how to make it well tested, how to uh, well do things in a really good way. And we tried to adapt these good ideas uh, and take them from Linux and bring them into the other space. Another iteration was uh, POSIX. When we first started with DevOps, we thought that there are a lot of things which should be more POSIX-like, like uh, along the command line or all these things. And uh, when we tried that, it really helped a lot, and uh, we got rid of a lot of strange things uh, in the new boot, which made a lot of problems uh, during, well, mostly during our life. I will bring out something we, we do in our daytime job, uh, so any new, new hardware or our desk which never run Linux before and then trying to make everything work when you don't know if the hardware works actually. Uh, this is something where the is very important. So, um, frameworks is pretty important. If you remember, uh, the old Linux 2.4, there have been a lot of drivers who just implemented interfaces. And today in Linux we have frameworks and mid layers in there which implement the interface and have an internal API. Uh, and uh, that's something we do in DevOps uh, quite often. Now. <coughs> File systems is also something uh, we have in DevOps these days. Uh, we just borrowed the table, the k contact frameworks from, from Linux, which gave us parallel uh, compilation. Uh, quite easily and all these things. Um, we have a standard shell, one of the difficult shells uh, where, you, where you can use commands like copy or ls and all these things. Uh, we have real scripting and so basically the idea is to get best of U-Boot and Linux and mix that together and still do it boot out of way without interrupts, without having things in parallel and uh, these, these things. So here is a typical startup from Dapbox, so it looks like you get a banner here and some messages about hardware stuff and then this typical <coughs> countdown here, even that the script in, in Dapbox can be thrown away, you can do it differently and all these things and then we get a command line and kind of things here. Um, we have our file systems, uh, basically the RAM file system which is mounted to slash if real mount on something like that. We have a device file system mounted to that, and the environment is copied to that path here. And then we have a kind of command line that very much feels like Linux. So if you're doing Linux uh, usually, um, and you're doing uh, bootloader stuff, then that this will feel really familiar. From time to time, you do things like type, typing boom or something like that. So, and the, sometimes one really forgets that this isn't the real Linux. Um, and you can do things like that, as see things here. And, uh, 
Okay, we have the voice notes and that here, let's see this. And uh, one really important thing if you bring up hardware is that you are able to access them. Uh, look around, look at your registers, try to find out what's going on, things like this. And what, what we are doing here is that, for example, there's this MD memory double command here, and that usually works on that RAM, and you can just look into the, the ROM root order of that MD uh, processor here, and uh, if, if you don't want to access uh, the, the normal physical memory, you can also use one of the other drivers available, like uh, in this case here, one of the Ethernet files, <coughs> and if you add uh, the word switch here for 16-bit access, you can see that you can just access the 16-bit uh, 16 um, word register uh, <coughs> this file. Uh, this is uh, pretty much debugging stuff, just find out what's going on in the hardware and uh, well, to, to, to bring up new, new electronics. Um, one of the most interesting concepts is that if you have a tile system, you can just start copying things that are around. You don't need any special commands for that anymore. Remember fetching the kernel from somewhere and putting it somewhere somewhere else in some other address. When, when I work on a new boot, I, I just confused all these hex addresses yeah, where you had to copy the kernel to and all these things. And uh, all this becomes much easier. Like uh, if you look at, for example, this here, this is just copying from that NAND zero to uh, well to somewhere. Um, in the file system, in the RAM file system, uh, and you can just say, I want to use this device, and you don't have to remember where this device was and uh, what the correct has to It's quite comfortable. Um, it's also possible to add uh, partitions, like, uh, well, when your kernel starts, it usually needs some idea about how your flash is partitioned, no flash, and flash, all these things. And uh, we have an add part command in that also as well. And you can just uh, give it a string here, which uh, specifies the layout of the partitions. And uh, then that was able to access that. And it's exactly the same so as like what the kernel needs. You can just take that over to the kernel command line and continue there. Quite comfortable as well. Um, another interesting concept is uh, device variables. For example, a device like uh, the first Ethernet device here can just have parameters. If you use the info command here, you can uh, call definfo ETH0. And then you see what the driver outputs for this device. And here you can see what the kind of parameters it has, like the IP address uh, and so on. And you can just uh, set it like a variable, like this here. So setting variables for devices is also uh, quite easy. Also getting the kernel by TFP, for example. Uh, recently, we are more going towards uh, having well, things automatically mounted, so you can even copy things from the TFP file system and things like that. So that's, that's all quite easy and it's very abstract if you compare that to our design for example. Okay, so this was basically a short introduction for those of you who are not familiar uh, with, with Gearbox yet and uh, didn't work with the bootloader in the past, just to get a little bit of an impression of how it looks like. And uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the free desktop bootloader <coughs> And if we uh, remember this image here, where we actually started uh, the system here, came to the decision point, and then wanted to call into one of, of, of these, well, call it distributions or Linux systems, um, then we have, in fact, we have one problem. Um, when you have actually started the kernel, then it's quite clear how, how the next steps look like. Uh, uh, you can give a the root file system uh, variable to the Linux kernel command line and have the kernel where it finds the root file system and all these things are quite clear. Um, but at this point here, where you need to, to do things, where you need to find out uh, where your root file systems could be, there is something like a gap in the specifications because uh, when, when all these things came up, uh, hardware was quite fixed. There was no no big um, well hot uh, clock uh, buses like USB memory sticks or SD cards or anything like that. Uh, 
when you built was written, you basically knew that you had uh, some nor flash or hand flash or something like that in, in your system, and there was nothing dynamic in that. Today, um, especially if you don't look at these deeply embedded uh, devices, but at things like MacBooks or more PC-like devices, then quite often you can just plug in an SD card and start from that, and you basically don't know anything about that. Uh, you, you, you want to look inside, you want to introspect that, and you want to find out what's in there. And this is basically something uh, where we have a, a gap in the specifications. Uh, we looked around how the big distributions do that today, um, especially on, on different ARM targets. And for example, if you look at uh, how um, Ubuntu works on, for example, the X53 Pixar board or the Panda board, uh, the Toshiba AC100 or um, OMAP3 Eagle board, then we find a lot of readme's or how to do this command, take this one, and then a lot of instructions you need to do in the right order, and in the end you get your system out of line. Basically the same if you look at uh, Debian on different uh, ARM systems, it's also more or less how to wear. Uh, you, you look into some VT, you, you, you collect your commands to do the right things, and then in the end it starts up, and when the kernel is up and running, then all the systems uh, feel almost uh, the same. Fedora, the same thing here. Uh, it's for every distribution, you, if you look out uh, on, on which ARM devices they are supported, you will find that uh, it's a completely different set. Yeah, one distribution has been tested by some people on, on uh, that hardware, and then the distribution on that other hardware, and they have written a how to, and, and then it is supported. But there's no generic way. Yeah, here is uh, where we have this little gap yeah, between the bootloader and the kernel. And there's nothing which, which is unified in, in that area so far. Uh, so it's basically a manual process. As I told you, with a lot of reading, and uh, in the end, the distribution do not have general ARM support for any board, which is readable, but just for a slack ARM So some years ago, there was this nice commercial here in, in uh, German computer magazine. So, uh, some company, I can't read this here, uh, where some companies said that the open operating system doesn't only have advantages, it's, it's, it's all different, it can take, uh, well, strange parts here. So this is basically the situation we have today. We have a lot of interesting hardware here, we have a lot of uh, distributions here, and uh, for, for any of these, you need to, to define something uh, special. This is where the free desktop computer specification uh, comes in, and this tries to fill this gap and tries to invent something here, which is which, which can be supported uh, for all these devices and makes it possible to discover what is what's in here. I'll show you some examples in the later. This is where you can find the computer uh, specification that's uh, coming from the startup people. Um, you know that Debian GNU system D or how is it called? I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, these people have invented that, and um, yeah, what, what it basically does is um, it offers a standard method how to find a partition to use as a tool, and it defines these bootloader entries which contain a drop-in text file per entry where you can just describe one of your operating system images you might have on your SD card. So let's, for example, just take a laptop with an SD card, something like that, uh, with different operating systems on, on, on the card, and uh, these entries define what's in there. And then you have, can have a directory here with a machine ID, and in there you have kernel and init ID, device tree, and, and so if you look at different hardware, this is what, what we currently care about, one of these uh, embedded words from the history here, or another one, uh, the socket here, like PGA or video board, something like that. And you see that there's a completely different set of uh, EMHC here, NAND, SD card, SD or something like that. Uh, and what the Google does want to do is it wants to look inside, wants to find out what's in there, and wants to well either select one of those or use any algorithm uh, to choose between them. 
So I found out to find the root partition. Um, on MBR, this uh, looks for a special partition with uh, type ODXDA. And on GPT, it looks like uh, for this UID here. And if it finds that, we can use that as uh, that root and looks for these entries. And the entries look like this one here. You basically just had a text file with a title, a version, a machine ID, options, Linux, init RV, and we added the device tree to the, to the specification. When you first write that on an embedded arm, the, uh, this option wasn't available before, and into the uh, spec recently. And this is basically everything the bootloader needs to know about uh, that boot target. And if you have this information, then well, that's basically all you need for one of the terminal slots I showed you on, on my first image over there. Okay, so what can you uh, do with, with a Google specification uh, when you have the system up and running? This is an example here from the uh, famous Cisco network, which is one, was one of the first ARM-based uh, networks within, I think, MX51 or something like that, for the XA8 CPU in the 800 megahertz uh, range, the smart code. And if you have that up and running, we can use that kernel uh, install command here, which is coming from the system B uh, project. And you can, for example, just tell it that you want to install it up and running. And if, if you just do that from your update or whatever, or from your, the package uh, manager, then it takes care of these bootloader entries, of these text files, and it provides everything the bootloader needs when you start it for the first time uh, to, uh, to have another entry with another kernel, for example. So this is also communication between the user space and uh, the early boot stage uh, where you have to write we you want to use that. No, I don't want to update. All right, so basically we have a single configuration file. Like if you remember, perhaps when you got this in former times, and uh, we have system we support for Google Pack with a prime install script. And so you can just install multiple distributions in parallel. You can, you can have Fedora, Debian, and Ubuntu, and whatever on, on one medium. And uh, you can even have one of the kernels of the distributions, and all that is just described uh, with the config file. Booter can then auto discover that, and uh, what, what we did with that was we had one uh, SD card and we plugged it into several, uh, well, completely different ARM CPU uh, based embedded devices. And it can just boot. Now remember if, uh, what, what the current community is doing right now. They are working on getting one unified kernel for ARM. Uh, we have all the decisions if you are on one model or another one. Uh, this is basically done on runtime and not on compile time anymore, like the former times. And the combination of these two things make it really possible that we can have one SD card and plug it into different devices and just boots just by detecting everything. Alright. So we have a good understanding of these boot targets now. Uh, when we started with the spec, uh, it already worked on SD cards or types which uh, are running with the X4 file system or in, in the embedded universe we quite often have uh, the DMCs which is basically an SD card uh, in a VGA case which you can already solder into your device. Um, that worked right out of the box, and what has been added uh, was open for the device tree support that we, that we can also describe our hardware uh, with an OF tree and support for um, well, flash based devices, real, real flash based devices, power flash and then flash based devices. And UBI of this, that was also what you have seen in my first demo uh, of a little device which just has an flash and UBFS uh, partition. All right. The second thing which came in last year called uh, Airbox is support for the open for the device tree. 
Um, we hope to that the Vice Treaty is, at least in my opinion, uh, or differently if you had asked me some years ago, but in the meantime, I think it's, it's a very nice uh, well, tool or method to, to just describe part of it, to declare what you have in your uh, system, everything which is not totally discoverable, like having certain chips on certain addresses on your address and data bus and these things. And uh, all that is designed by Masi in a great way in the open filter device tree. And the more this is used in the kernel, the more we thought about that we, well, really need the same information in the bootloader space as well. Uh, in the bootloader, there are a lot of uh, points where you need to access some hardware, where you need to do some decisions uh, based on where the, the different, different devices in your hardware are and, uh, in order to initialize them. And what we did there basically was um, that we added uh, the firmware device tree support also to Bearbox. So uh, you can, in fact, use the same device tree you use for your mainland kernel and put it in Bearbox and then compile Bearbox with that. And then it does all the initial hardware breakdown from the device tree. Now it looks where all the devices are, which I suppose C devices are, and your bus and which address, and all these things, and it starts the initialization from there. So from our point of view, uh, remember we are doing a lot of uh, Linux counterparting to new hardware. Uh, this made it a lot easier to, to bring up Linux on, on new boards. For example, uh, we have a lot of uh, well, hardware boards uh, you know, working on with uh, the Freescale IOTX family, for example. And if I remember how that worked, let's say two or three years ago, it was always a lot of low level hacking, a lot of programming, writing board files, and these things, pushing things through the compiler. And if you compare that to how that works these days, um, it's basically writing in the OF tree. So if you have written in the OF tree and have, have described your hardware, have uh, specified where all the devices are, then you are basically done. You just feed the device tree to the uh, bootloader, to Bearbox, and well, it works. If you find everything right, of course. Okay, the same device tree can be used to start the kernel. So you can just hand that over from the bootloader to the kernel. Works more or less automatically. Uh, there are other nice features in Bearbox, for example, that you can runtime patch the device tree. Uh, we sometimes have the case that uh, there are very little boards, let's say it was 512 megabytes of RAM or with one gigabyte of RAM, and if you can't auto detect that, you can just, if you know that, you can just write a little runtime patch for the device tree and put that into Bearbox. Uh, and so you can just put it there, and then it loads the device tree, changes that entry to, to what you already know, and then handle it off to the kernel and start. It works quite nicely. Um, an interesting application for that is um, the declaration of this place. We have one embedded system which is often used uh, for the uh, for the displays for train stops and, and that uh, kind of applications. And what happens there is that if the display breaks and needs to be exchanged, and the technician goes goes up there and mounts a new display, and uh, well, he, he doesn't doesn't know much about software, right? He, he just knows how to screw the display into the case and all that. And uh, what they are doing there is that they just put that device tree with a new display description onto a USB stick. The technician just puts it in, that box just reads that description from the USB sticks and runtime patches that into the OF tree and starts over. And so the technician doesn't, know, doesn't need to know anything but how to plug in the USB stick and get that description. Very nice and makes it quite easy to, to describe properly. Um, there's a downside in that, and everybody who has used this device tree in the past probably knows that uh, the device tree very much depends on the stability of the bindings. So since we have device tree based kernels, uh, one of the reasons, uh, well, the most prominent reason why the board uh, refers to boot is that something changed in the device tree and some other component didn't take care of that. Um, the awareness for that grew quite a lot in the kernel community recently. Uh, the kernel developers are really, really taking care of not changing those device 
tree bindings. It doesn't work in any case, and uh, still uh, a reason for for including these days, but it has become much, much better than if you look at the All right, some other abilities. Um, for example, we have uh, multi-image support in DevOps here. Uh, with multi-image support, it's easily possible, this is the here, uh, it's quite easy to build um, multiple images uh, from the same config. With the case that we have one DevOps configuration, remember that's just kconfig, we type make menu config and then you can change things. And sometimes you have a whole family for different devices with different CPUs, in a core or a blue core or something like that, on a mixed things, for example, or uh, well works which are just a little bit different, uh, then it's, it's possible like with a kernel, you can switch on all the different variants in kconfig. And the uh, build system automatically builds a lot of uh, images out of that in one one. It makes it quite easier to have just one compiler one and you generate a lot of other things and have quite a lot more better uh, compiler coverage and, and that kind of things. And for these auto detectable uh, devices, there's a nice detect command now. So that on introspective devices like USB or SD, we don't know before what was in there. And usually you have the situation that if you look on any boot, what's what's on that USB uh, bus, for example, this needs quite a lot of time. If you want to achieve fast boot times, like in my video, uh, with five seconds up to the point where the application is running, then you usually can't probe all the possible buses, SD cards, and, and uh, USB uh, until then. And for example, in that case, I told you uh, with the with the train uh, displays, um, what it does there is it looks if a USB stick is connected, and only if it is connected, it uh, runs attack and looks what's in there and tries to do something and all the, the protocol level and utilization kind of things. So that's also quite nice. Yeah, then we can, for development quite nice, you can mount all the devices at once with so mount minus A. And uh, this is quite new. This is uh, an excerpt from the Pangatronics uh, internal IRC from Friday evening, Friday night, now Friday evening here. And um, where one of the colleagues here is uh, working on, on this uh, television VPPT uh, uh, device with an MX27 uh, CPU on it, uh, which just uh, has a television receiver on one side, a network on the other side, and you can stream uh, television to the local network. And uh, on this device, he's, he's working on NFS version 3 support uh, in DevOps. And as you can see here, you can uh, have a look at uh, the file system on the server here. And if version 3 is pretty important for us, because if we have that, we can basically get rid of uh, the requirement to have a TFTP server for development. I mean, if, if you're doing uh, good early development, in, in most cases you will probably have a TFTP server running, right? Because uh, you need to fetch your kernel from somewhere. And uh, if, uh, you can do the same thing with NFS. And the interesting thing there is that you can uh, use user space in FS daemon and you don't need to install anything on, on the development machine anymore. Uh, installing things on the development machine is usually something where you need, you need to do a lot of things correctly, uh, choose the right TFTP daemon, that's not an easy task sometimes. There uh, are so many different ones with different tracks and different features. And uh, we try to get rid of that. And uh, well, we are also working with PDAs that uh, cross the system. And in PDAs, we have a feature where we can just uh, run a command and then expose our root file system via NFS root. And now we can also uh, expose the kernel via NFS version 3, all from user space without needing root access. And then the root can, uh, the board can boot up and uh, do more things. So it's quite new to the, today's knowledge, not, not even in the repositories yet. And I think quite an interesting thing, which makes uh, development a lot easier. All right, so if you want to try that, uh, here's uh, the most important uh, communication channel. You have the website, uh, www.demox.org, and RIC, IRC channel, and uh, Freenode. And uh, we have uh, this mailing list here, which is the main communication channel, basically, where you can send your patches, your tree, and all that 
we find that uh, that would solve it. All right, that, that's my talk. Thanks for coming. Do you have questions? Okay, I see. Seen that you have also firmware update support in Bearbox. Could you elaborate on that? Um, firmware update in, in which sense? I mean, writing a kernel to some. I don't know, know. I've just system. seen a menu option in the configure yeah. menu of Bearbox. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what you mean. Maybe it's just something we can do later on and have yeah, a look at the, at the sources. Maybe for FPGA. Any idea of your market share? I mean, your competition is essentially uh, U boot, and uh, do you have any idea on how many of those boards are choosing one or the other project? Um, well, basically, the thing is that uh, we don't really see that as competition. I mean, it's all open source software, and for us, one of the most important uh, well things behind doing this is getting more problems solved. Uh, so we usually look at what other projects are doing. We are looking at what you is doing. We are looking at what the kernel is doing uh, from time to time. I mean, that's a nice thing. It's open source. You can just look what other people are doing. Just take something from there, port it over to your uh, environment, and uh, the other way around. Uh, I, I don't see this as concurrent situation or something like that. It's just all this this vibrant open source community and where you can, well, not, not invent everything from scratch, but, uh, well, a lot of this wouldn't have been possible without you would be there. Uh, so that's basically 
taking a driver from the kernel if you really need to, uh, well, making it easier, remove the parallelism, and then put it in there. So it works quite nicely. Uh, in fact, we don't really like this. Yeah, because it's code application in the end, and we don't like code application like anyone else is working with that. But uh, if, if you look at my use cases with, with all these uh, fallback images and things like, things like that, that basically doesn't work without any instance which takes care about that decision point or the algorithms how to choose which partition and how to choose which filter or something like that. So this is basically what, what still drives uh, that we think you need a bootloader even today. Uh, and things like just starting the kernel is, is no real option for, for most cases. There are well, so the use cases where this is an option. But uh, there are a lot of really good use cases out there with real devices where it uh, really doesn't work. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, then thanks for being here. And if you have other questions, you might also come.